Okay, welcome to our second keynote talk uh, to be given by Frank Lance. Frank is a game designer with a focus on exploring emerging technology to create new kinds of gameplay. He has taught game design for over 20 years and is the founding chair of the New York University Game Center and co-founder of Area Code Games and Everybody House Games. As well as producing an influential body of academic work on games, Frank has also designed some of the very best recent games. Uh, these include two of my personal favorites, Drop7, which is one of the most replayable mobile puzzle games that often appears on top 100 lists of video games, and Universal Paperclips, which is a masterpiece of minimalist design that takes the player on an unexpected journey just by clicking on a web form. Frank helped pioneer the genre of large-scale and real-world games, including the big urban game, which turned the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul into the world's largest board game. He also worked on Shark Runners, which allowed players to interact with live sharks, and Pac Manhattan, a life size version of the arcade classic. His recent board game, Hey Robot, has become a regular feature on The Tonight Show on US TV. Frank is interested in understanding games as an aesthetic form, how games connect people, express ideas, generate meaning, and create beauty. Uh, he's recently released a very nice book, The Beauty of Games, published last month by MIT Press, and he'll now talk about games, computability, AI, and aesthetics. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, so is that visible? Okay, yes. good. So, yeah, so my goal with this talk is to just slightly shift our perspective on this collective project that we're all involved in, in analyzing games and studying games within this context. I kind of just want to change everyone's point of view slightly, uh, maybe like 12%, give everyone like a slightly different uh, angle on this, uh, on, on, on this project. And, um, and I'm, I'm hoping to, to do that within the, the the context of what it means to study games and their relationship to computers and AI in late 2023. I mean, it cannot have escaped our attention that the meaning of this conference is different now, uh, given what's happening in general uh, with, with AI and in the culture about people thinking about these topics. Um, and so I kind of want to uh, speak a little bit to to that larger uh, context and and uh, and uh, and and it involves uh, changing our use of this word. So the the sort of the heart of what I want to do is to to take this word aesthetics and uh, change our perspective on this word, and by doing so, kind of open up this new angle on the project that we're all involved in. Um, so one way of, uh, yeah, so one way of addressing this is really to ask about what are the aesthetic aspects of a board game like chess? Um, now a very common and widespread use of the term aesthetics is to talk about, uh, a certain set of features of, of a game, the, the visuals, the graphics, uh, the sort of decorative and cosmetic elements, the surface features of a game, um, the thematic representational qualities of a game, as opposed to its deeper formal structure, its systemic uh, structure. So that's a very widespread and common use of aesthetics. That's the one I kind of want to reject, or at least temporarily. Look, this is a perfectly good use of the term. It's one that I myself use. If you ask, you know, if we're talking about a board game and you ask me, hey, what are what are the aesthetics like? I know what you mean. You're, you're asking me like, what, what is the quality of the pieces or the design of the cards? And and that's a perfectly good and useful way of, of using that word. But what it does is I think distract us from this larger sense of the term aesthetics, which I think is equally important and somewhat overlooked, which is that, uh, which is the use of aesthetics to describe a sort of general category of human activity. Uh, something like music, literature, film, 
cinema. And so it, it is my claim that that is the category that games really kind of belong in. Um, and it, not in some kind of uh, precise or, you know, uh, exclusive sense. Uh, I don't think that things like games are uh, ultimately resolved to some kind of clear definition, uh, categorical definition like that. But I think in a broad sense that uh, it, it really does make sense to view games alongside these other art forms as being, as a general category of human experience, something very much like music or dance or literature or film or, or, or movies, um, albums, you know, things like that. Um, and so if we think about the, the shift that I'm, that I'm proposing, it's going from including aesthetics as one element alongside a game's formal systems and our use of math to analyze it, uh, a game as a kind of problem solving, cognitive exercise, uh, questions of psychology, of player psychology, social interaction, all of these different ingredients. You could, you know, instead of thinking of aesthetics as one element among those, you can say, no, all of the ingredients that go into a game, into playing games and making games and analyzing games are all part of what is an overall aesthetic experience, right? This is this is the, the, the frame that I kind of want to shift. So instead of thinking of it as alongside these other things, I want to think of it as the, the kind of general category in which all games exist. Now, I think it's sort of easy to see this in the case of video games. When we talk about video games, it's easy to see that there's something like these other things uh, and they they quite clearly, you know, kind of exhibit the, those qualities that make them feel like, oh, yeah, this is something similar to to music or literature. Um, but the question is, what about all these other games that are not video games, right, that are not uh, they're not products? You know, maybe they don't always have a clear author. Um, they work as kind of like lifestyles or hobbies often. Um and uh, they're they're they tend to be more abstract, um, kind of like have less of a of a uh, representational surface. And these are the kind of games that that we study at a conference like this. You know, the the kinds of games that we we're, we're talking about uh, today are games like you know like chess or bridge uh, or Twixt. Um, but alongside all of these other kind of like you know traditional. Uh, non-digital uh, types of games. Now, there's actually a, a, a body of, of work that kind of addresses these questions, that treats games like this as aesthetic objects. Uh, David Foster Wallace talking about tennis as a kind of art form. Uh, Joyce Carol Oates uh, analyzing boxing and, and uh, using a lot of the kinds of uh, uh, the same kind of approach and seriousness that you would bring to analyzing literature. Uh, Hans Gumbrecht, uh, famous work in praise of athletic beauty, talking about uh, uh, athletics um, in aesthetic terms. Lots of good work on poker, uh, talking about it in these ways. And I think that in some ways, my argument for this broad claim is just that it makes intuitive sense. You know, I, I don't, I'm not trying to like make a claim that I think is interesting or, or bold. Um, it just seems somewhat obvious that that's the kind of thing that games are, both video games and non-video games. They are the kind of thing that's similar to music. We do them in a similar way for similar reasons. They have a lot of the same kinds of uh, general qualities that there's something we do, you know, voluntarily. We do them for their own sake. Um, we do them in pursuit of entertainment and, and relaxation and fun, but also in pursuit of beauty and meaning. And so that's kind of what I want to, that's the, the larger frame that I want to uh, start with, that games are an aesthetic form. And then to follow up on that, okay, wh why does that matter? Like, well, what does that mean, first of all? Why does it matter? And what does it have to do with this larger question of, of computation and artificial intelligence? 
So first of all, what kinds of experiences are aesthetic experiences? Well, they are things that we do for their own sake. They're they're non-utilitarian uh, by and large. Um, that doesn't mean that they aren't sometimes done for other purposes, you know, in, in the same way that, um, you know, we can say music is something that we do primarily for its own sake. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, like there, there's the ABC song that is educational. We use that to help teach uh, the alphabet. Uh, but in general, we these are things that we do that um, are not things that we would skip in order to get their effect. You know, that's a good rule of thumb. Um, there are things that where the experience itself is a primary essential part of what we care about it and what we value about it. Uh, that um, And so that I think is an important feature. They are done for, for entertainment. They're done for a certain kind of pleasure. Um, but they're also uh, experiences that we do in pursuit of beauty and meaning. These, these larger and harder to pin down, but very, very important values uh, that we get from aesthetic experiences. <clears throat> uh, aesthetic experiences are the realm of in which taste operates, uh, which is which means two kind of complementary things. First of all, it's it's a realm in which, our experiences are deeply personal, idiosyncratic, kind of non-objective in a sense. Like there, there is a sense in which when we are in pursuit of objective truths in a project, like a scientific project, that there's a sense that these truths are, are out there and we can sort of like work our way towards them collectively and we're trying to approach them and discover them and find them there's a sense in in aesthetic experiences in which the the truths that we're discovering start deep inside of us that they're we we react in a certain way to 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 a beautiful song like imagine a a, a beautiful aria in an, in an opera and and imagine the the kind of personal experience that we have uh to that that's that's a, an essential part of of aesthetic experience it's not you know we don't think of it as being a thing where we're just acknowledging some objective fact it's a thing where we are responding personally uh, sensually right it, using our using our, our, our you know emotionally and 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 bodily often um to to the experience uh and bringing our very personal uh all of the the particular details of our personal life, we're bringing those to bear on uh, on understanding and experiencing this this thing. At the same time, taste is a social realm. It's a uh, it is a it is intersubjective. It is discursive. Right? There is no private, despite it being this very personal thing. Aesthetic experiences they're not private experiences. Um, and this is a point that that Kant makes when kind of laying the foundations of modern aesthetic theory, when he talks about the reaction, the personal reaction we have to something beautiful contains within it an understanding that other people would have a similar feeling. It is a kind of shared humanity that we're reacting to. Um, and even if you think of that very personal response to, let's say, a beautiful aria in an opera, even that is social to begin with, right? There's a connection between you and the singer, between you and the composer. Uh, and and so, but, but beyond that, there's also a sense in which we are always in the process of negotiating with other people uh, the 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 meanings of our personal reactions. So taste is a realm of discussion and and argument. And uh, now it's not the kind of argument that you can win with with deduction. You can't show. You can't demonstrate uh, that it is a necessary truth 
that Shakespeare is a good writer. But you you can sort of you can acknowledge the 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 established truth that it is the consensus that Shakespeare is a great writer, and you can sort of demonstrate that. But the kinds of ways that you argue uh, a uh, about taste involve a, a kind of different a different process. It's a different way of arguing than the way we argue about uh, scientific truths, about logical truths. Often it's it involves sort of instructions for how to appreciate something. We say, well, look, you have to start with Shakespeare. First of all, you have to understand this about the historical context, or you should start with, with these works. And now kind of like put yourself in this thing or like understand this or like read it in this way. We're trying to get people to the place where they can understand and appreciate it. Or we can make arguments that involve like, look, you like A and you like B and look at, you can see these qualities here, A and B are present in this work. You've just overlooked them. Um, so these are the kinds of arguments we have. But the fact is that we do, um, the fact that we do have these arguments about taste is very important. It's very important that it's not simply that first one where it's like, oh, de gustibus non disputandum est. No, 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 there's lots of disputandum. <laughs> it's like, it's an essential part of taste, all the disputandum that goes on. Um, and as a result of all of this, uh, I think of aesthetic experience as being irreducible, right? It, 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 which, which is to say, it doesn't cash out in some other domain. We, it doesn't fully cash out. It doesn't mean that you can't ever say, for example, oh, look, your tastes, our collective tastes, are the result of uh, of a Darwinian evolution under certain conditions, and therefore we like this or we like that. It's sort of like, or, or to say that, look, taste is just a matter of of expressing, you know, your, of trying to like navigate through a prestige hierarchy and we're demonstrating our good taste. And like all of these things are part of taste um, and part of aesthetic experience, but kind of none of them are sufficient to fully capture and fully explain. There is something in which uh, the, it, it, aesthetic experience always eludes our attempts to reduce it to some other explanatory frame or some other justification by which we say, okay, this is what makes uh, uh, an aesthetic experience valuable in some other um, currency, right? That it's useful because it helps us generate ideas or it helps us communicate. It makes us better people. So neither in terms of explanation nor in terms of justification do these things ever fully cash out there. And in that, to my mind, is what makes them um, what I call weird. Um, it's this property of kind of, it, 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 when I say weird, it means they're kind of separate from ordinary life. They, they really never, as much as we can use the kind of ordinary, um, uh, tools of analyzing and thinking about them and framing them and talking about them, they always uh, remain a little bit aloof, a little bit separate, never comfortably kind of resolve to those, uh, existing frameworks. So as an example, of the weirdness of aesthetic experience. Let's look at, at Duchamp. Um, Marcel Duchamp, famous 20th century artist. And we have two Duchamp works. On the left here, Portrait of Chess Players from 1911. And on the right, Fountain uh, from six years later, uh, which was this famous, uh, bizarre kind of disruptive piece where he, uh, where he took a urinal and put it on its side, signed it, and submitted it to this uh, fancy art uh, exhibition. Um, so, so first of all, when you're looking at this, uh, painting, uh, from 1911, you can use, you can, there's a, a set of criteria that we know how to apply in terms of thinking about this painting. We can talk about it in terms of its co color, its form, its texture, the patterns, the subject matter, the ways in which the subject matter is represented, uh, its relationship to abstraction versus, uh, simulation or mimesis. And, um, but then when we talk about fountain, it's much harder to understand, like, what is the criteria we should be bringing to bear to analyze this thing? Um, we, certainly we can talk about these formal qualities of color and form and texture. And I think those are important uh, in understanding that there is something about why Duchamp picked this particular object. Um, it's not just purely random. It has something to do with its shape. It's interesting by, by rotating it, he makes us aware of the formal qualities of a thing that we would otherwise uh, ignore. 
um, or just find completely mundane. All of a sudden we're noticing them and thinking about them. Um, you know, like what is it? There's something like there's something funny about the fact that he's taking something that we pee into and putting it on a pedestal and, and, and bringing it into the gallery. Like that's weird and interesting. That's clearly like a trollish, you know, move uh, for, for someone to do. Like here we have the sacred space of the art gallery kind of and we have normal life in its most crude kind of intruding um that's that's weird like yeah what are these questions of representation and abstraction like what how to the whole thing is clearly a a kind of um intervention by duchamp where he's calling our attention to the system of art itself he's He's calling our attention to this, to the framing device uh, of the process of art, of how we m- make it and look at it and and display it and analyze it, and and calling our attention to the set of criteria that we use to analyze it and interpret it and understand it, um, and in a very um, yeah, in a very aggressive and and uh, important way, he's he's taking this thing which was this kind of invisible uh, structuring element of how art works. And he's kind of bringing it into the art and, and making us aware of it. Uh, another way, so so th- that aspect of, of Fountain, it, it, you can see very discursive, right? In a sense, Duchamp is like in conversation with the, with the, with the, the board of people who are deciding what is allowed in this particular exhibition. And that when they first saw Fountain, they rejected it. And then, you know, so he submitted it kind of anonymously. And then it was like, he was, he was specifically kind of, of, of having this, this uh, discursive uh, quality that I'm talking about is, is like a, a big part of that, of, of that uh, move. But there's another sense in which artworks and aesthetic works are discursive um, which is that they are always in conversation with other works that are happening um, historically around the same time uh, and and in the future. Uh, that um, the, the meaning of an artwork, and so here we see both of uh, both of these works, uh, Portrait of the Chess Players and and uh, and Fountain, sort of like in the context of some other works from around the same time, either the same year or right around the same year. And um, and so it's important to understand that that these that, that aesthetic experiences never exist in a vacuum. They're open in the sense that they there a lot of their meaning comes from the the context of the of the works around them. Um, one way of of thinking about this is to imagine a a symphony, and imagine a symphony where there's one particular note that is extremely important um, and powerful and imagine isolating that note and saying, okay, listen to this, like listen to the way the brass works and the timpani is coming in at the same time and the violins and the string sections and and it all comes together and it's like, ta-da, you know, and you, and you hear that important note. It's like, yeah, that, that, that could be a a crucial and important thing that the, the, the timbre and the volume and the, and the, and the, and that 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 single note can be very important, but we think of like the real important meaning of a symphony as being how that note is situated within the pattern of other notes. And that's what creates, uh, you know, that's what creates melody. That that's what creates dynamism. Like that's the you, you would you would never like isolate a single note and say that's what's important. Now, in a sense, the same is true for the entire symphony. Right, in a sense, right? So we have this kind of um, Markov blanket that we throw over, you know, something like a symphony and we and we try to imagine it as its own like standalone separate work whose meaning we can understand. But like, it seems intuitive if you kind of relax that and, and understand like how, you know, the how symphonies actually work and the and the way that the things that we care about them the things that they mean and the things that that uh, the ways that we respond to them are so much about 
the kind of established conventions, our expectations, um, and and so on and so forth. Uh, think about like, you know, the famous stories of uh, uh, the um, Sacre du Printemps, you know, and people storming out of the, the theater or, um, you know, the, the ways in which, like understanding like musical genres. I mean, you can't understand punk rock without understanding, you know, Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin that, that preceded it, you know, this idea of of cl- the bombast of classic rock and the kind of instrumental uh, over, you know, overblown instrumental skill of progressive rock uh, versus the kind of do it yourself uh, aesthetic of punk like these like that's true of of um of of all aesthetic experiences in a really important way. So that's a sense in which they're discursive and open uh, to their environment. They're open and evolving. Um, yeah. So so this weirdness of aesthetic experiences is that they are they're they're discursive in this really interesting way. They're context sensitive. They're open. They are they're messy and hard to pin down. The criteria for which uh, we should be applying is always kind of like up in the air and uh, under it's kind of ad hoc and shifting and they're evolving and they're adversarial in a particular way. I think in a very important way uh, that there is a sense in which the creator is in an adversarial relationship, a mutually beneficial adversarial relationship to the audience uh, in the same way that two chess players are in a mutually beneficial adversarial relationship as they push themselves deeper and deeper into the problem collective problem solving of a game of chess. Uh, the the stand up comic is in that relationship with with her audience, um, and every creative person is in is in that relationship with their audience. Where it's um, there is a sense in which I am always looking to create something that surprises you. S- surprise and novelty are an important part of uh, of aesthetic experience and and the audience's um, ability to kind of predict and and uh, and understand the the formula that the creative person is using um, is kind of the limit on corniness. Right, that is imposed on all aesthetic experiences. We we know when something is corny, when it is, uh, you know, it's predictable, it's formulaic, and 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 therefore boring. Um, and so that that kind of like adversarial relationship is, is a very important one, uh, and 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 contributes to this weirdness. Um, here are a couple of quotes from Marcel Duchamp, which I think illustrate uh, th- these qualities. Um, he says the danger is in pleasing an immediate public, the immediate public that comes around you, uh, takes you in and accepts you and gives you success and everything. Instead of that, um, you should work for 50 years or a hundred years for your true public. Uh, is an interesting thought. Um, here he goes even deeper. He says, I have forced myself to contradict myself in order to avoid conforming to my own taste. So here's an example of that kind of ad- rec- him recognizing this adversarial dynamic and wanting to bring it to his own. Like he doesn't want to like apply his own taste as, as in a formulaic way and produce work. He wants to always be kind of like eluding that and 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 outrunning his own um, his own capacity. Uh, he he asked, "Can works be made which are not of art?" And um, and then famously. Duchamp loved chess. Um, and, and here he's saying a game of chess is a visual and plastic thing. And if it isn't geometric in the static sense of the word, it is mechanical since it moves. It's a drawing. It's a mechanical reality. So Duchamp very, very uh, much uh, believed in this kind of aesthetic equality of games uh, this this uh, and chess in particular, which he loved. Um, he said, while all artists are not chess players, all chess players are artists. And sort of famously in the in the second half of his career, he basically said, look, I'm not going to make art anymore. I'm just going to play chess. And he took it very seriously. This was not a troll. Um, he played chess on the national French team uh, in international tournaments. Uh, he wrote, here's a book he wrote uh, called The Opposition and Sister Squares Reconciled, which was a, a theoretical um, work on analyzing uh, the chess strategy. Um, so he took this very seriously. He was like, look, I'm bored of, of art and um, I'm just going to play chess now uh, because that's, um, you know, equally beautiful, even even more beautiful. Um, now, it turns out he 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 hadn't stopped making art uh, during this time. Um, this was kind of a bit of a troll because he was making uh, some of his most important works 
Uh, but this was kind of the, this thing that he announced and, and talked about. Now, it's to me, it's important to recognize the tension here between the qualities of chess. Uh, when you look at chess and you think, okay, what's going on when you play chess? What's what are the properties of chess? It it, it doesn't seem weird in these in these ways I'm describing. Like it actually is objective. There is an objective truth. That's why we're here. We're st studying the, the objective truths inside of chess as a scientific project. And you can uh, study those. You can think them. So it's objective. It, it is context free, right? Um, it's a closed system. It's it's not open. Uh, it's not messy. It's neat. Uh, and it's not evol this evolving, ongoing thing. It is fixed. Um, and it's adversarial in this, in this kind of internal way, right? That the, that it is this relationship between the two players as they dig deeper and deeper into the formal system uh, that produces the truths of chess. But they really, these things seem to be sort of the opposite of what I'm talking about. But again, the important thing to keep in mind is what I'm saying is that what chess is doing is taking all of these qualities and making an aesthetic experience from them. So even though playing chess is an exercise in a kind of logical problem solving, a cognitive task within a fixed closed system. Um, there's nothing logical about choosing to play chess, like devoting your life to playing chess isn't logical at all, right? That's not, that's like a weird, that's where the weirdness of chess is, right? It's, it's, it's in the, the kind of larger pleasure and meaning and beauty that we get from these things like what is it about these things that we find meaningful what are those meanings what is that beauty what is the entertainment we get from it uh what is it that compels us about it what is it that makes it interesting or fun or cool or not um these are the senses in which uh and that's what makes it especially interesting because because in a sense games are the art form um, of instrumental reason, right? This is, you know, uh, when you look at a game like chess, you see that that's what's going on here. We're, we're like actually like asking these larger, more discursive questions about, not just about like, oh, what color do you like or what sounds are good or what patterns or structures or what stories, but like about these questions of logic and and knowledge and facts and systems and and things like that. Um, now, I think it's important to recognize how like this this project of relation of, of, of relating board games like chess to artificial intelligence is one that goes, uh, I think, very deep. Uh, in, in 1819, Charles Babbage played the Mechanical Turk and he sort of knew that it was a hoax, uh, but it was enough to get him really started thinking about um, you know, the, like where this stuff could go and like could th this transition from the difference engine to the analytical engine um, was was very much like if you look at his notebooks, very much inspired by these questions of, OK, what 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 can you do with mechanical processes? Could you even do something like play chess? Um, and it's partly not just because of the formal qualities of chess as a system. It's also because of the status of chess, the way chess isn't just an exercise in thinking, chess represents thinking as an aesthetic work. Uh, it is it is a it is a work about thinking, um, and so that was I think one of the reasons that uh, that that Babbage was interested in it. And then of course, uh, Alan Turing, uh, before computers existed, one of the first things Alan Turing did was write a program. So this was like in um, I think uh, thirty uh, like. 40, maybe 40s, late 40s, uh, Alan Turing and David Shapernown wrote uh, Turo Chess. So this is a um, uh, Turo Champ. And this is a, a modern, someone's modern day attempt to, to reproduce it. Uh, but Turing also was thinking about, uh, was thinking about Go and I'm sorry, thinking about chess and, and games like it um, as a kind of inspiration for uh, for thinking about these larger questions of what computers are, what they could be, what what they might be good for. And I think a lot of people kind of don't recognize how important it was that Turing's thoughts about this were grounded in question, these larger questions about the foundations of math that, that were happening, that, that go all the way back to Leibniz 
in in you know the 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 17th century uh thinking about this question of like what is truth like what is mathematical truth like is there a mechanical process that we could have uh that's something like calculus that could like tell us you know what what is true and what isn't true um and of course captured in david hilbert's uh, set of problems um and this is kind of a paraphrase of, of Hilbert's uh, 10th problem, uh, is there an algorithm that determines whether a statement is valid? But like, this is definitely part of like this ongoing question that, uh, you know, Bertrand Russell and Gottlob Frege were struggling with at the beginning of the 20th century. Like, is like, what can we know for sure? Like, is math, for example, like the closest thing we have to like, uh, like a like a thing where we can know we can say certain things for sure. Like, is it is it possible to like put math on a solid foundation uh, in a way that um, we just know that we know what we're dealing with, and then like we you know these are the axioms, these are the, the 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 deductive steps that are allowed, and like by applying these steps to these axioms, can we produce all the truths of mathematics? It seemed intuitively that you that the answer might be yes. Um, and it's, and it's important, like, like it's at a really, really deep, important question. Uh, it's not just that they're, they're a question about, can you automate this process? It's not about like, oh, we're, we're lazy and we want a machine where you could just turn a crank and it spits out theorems. You know, that wasn't the point. The point is not just that you're going to turn the crank and, and generate all this stuff and we can sit back and have a Mai Tai, you know, the, the point is to say, what can we know for sure? What can we know that isn't like the knowing we do with Shakespeare, where it's like, oh, you think this, everyone seems to think this, but I think differently. And you know what I mean? Like, look, I'm going to try to persuade you by, you know, by telling you about this and, you know, by trying to like butter you up and convince you like all the kind of soft, you know, the softness of these, these other ways that we, you know, convince each other of things that we want to like, know, is it possible to have hard truths that are, that are absolute, that are that are known for sure, because they're necessary truths, and that's really what these the this, this set of questions is all about. And um, the answer is no. Famously, you know, this is what uh, Alan Turing uh, demonstrated with with um, you know his his response to Hilbert's tenth uh, thing the, the, and Chaidung's problem. You know, the answer is no. You 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 don't. The halting problem shows you know are are that there there are certain facts that we can't um, capture uh, using uh, formal systems. And this was work alongside famously uh, Godel, uh, Alonzo Church. Um, they were all kind of around the same time uh, uh, demonstrating the limitations uh, to, to this kind of thing by, by showing the ways in which uh, computability was limited, like th that uh, you know, there, there are deep kind of paradoxes of self-reference um, that, uh, that mean that no formal system uh, can ever be uh, both complete and correct, um, that there's always going to be uh, some mathematical truths that elude our ability to show for sure uh, that and, you know, to, to know that they are necessary uh, as, as a result of following these uh, these allowed deductive steps. Now, I think it's important to recognize that at the same time that Alan Turing was inventing computers and demonstrating the, the kind of limits of knowledge, he was also like working, uh, you know, it, it, on on the on this device, which was grounded in very high stakes, very practical, uh, real problems, solving real world problems. Because you might think, oh, like if you encounter these limits, um, that that means that kind of like nothing is possible or that we have to kind of give up the whole project or that, you know, um, everything is up for grabs and it's all loosey goosey. It's like, no, no, no. It's important to recognize that this doesn't mean an end to the utility or the the functionality that um that these things you know uh continue co computers and, and computation uh continues to be like this incredibly powerful way of 
solving real world problems. And it continues to be something that is grounded in pragmatic and, and serious and high stakes uh, problem solving. And the same is true of, uh, of Marcel Duchamp, like, like once you, you would think, okay, once you've shown a toilet in a, in an art gallery, it's like, oh, it's that you're just saying it's the end of art. Nothing else matters, blah, blah, blah. And this is not the case. Like art continued to go on and it was very important and very influential, uh, uh fountain. Um, but then you, you had, the, you had all of modern art after, uh, fountain, you had, uh, the abstract expressionist, you had pop art and you had a whole category of new kinds of work, which were conceptual art, which had their own kind of like masterpieces um, in, in the wake of, of uh, the uh, Marcel Duchamp showing what was possible and what, showing what could happen. So um, while it is in some sense, a kind of limiting or, you know, you might think almost a nihilistic move uh, um, in other ways, it's very constructive and, and creative and opens up new possibilities uh, that continue to be grounded in the real world. Um, yeah, the, uh, this machine kills fascists is uh, 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 um, Guthrie's uh, guitar says this. And whenever I think of the guitar as uh, described as a machine, I think of Vinnie Riley and the Druidy column, one of my favorite uh, musicians. So, um, so games as AI research, they've always been this kind of of AI research. I think that games uh, like uh, chess and Go have always been, in a sense doing AI research even before we had computers because they were these aesthetic works that were exploring cognitive problem solving in a, in a, in a, in a formal system. Um, and the fact that they're aesthetic works and, and, and weird is it's like, I think an important um, uh, ingredient of, of AI uh, going back to, to its uh, origins. Um, you know, there are two kinds of questions uh, in games. One is the kinds of question like which move is best, formal questions that, that can be answered objectively, and then questions about those questions. What does that mean? Like why, you know, what does it what does it mean to trade off style uh, versus accuracy? As we saw earlier today, like what are like what you know what are heuristics versus search? Like what are the broader um, you know consequences of 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 these questions? I think. Uh, you know, and and I think this larger question of like, what does it mean to use games as a benchmark for cognitive performance in AI systems is one of these larger uh, questions. I want to show a few um, examples here. One is uh, a paper done by by Cameron Brown um, about elegance in game design, where he evokes the Japanese term shibuyi uh, to talk about um, the a whole set of kind of aesthetic qualities and to try to understand whether they could be captured formally, you know, using kind of like this idea of uh, a relationship of, of a small set of rules mapping to a large set of data. I think it's a really important, interesting uh, kind of information theoretic approach to looking at aesthetic questions. Work I did myself, this is a paper I did with Julian Tegelius on the question of depth uh, whether the way that we talk about a uh, game being deep uh, in a formal sense, whether that can be captured in uh, in a kind of uh, objective mathematical property of a game when I'm looking at like, so we looked at like the way different strategies uh, improve as you give them incrementally more computational uh, power. Um, and I think both of these are interesting, promising uh, ways of approaching this, but I think they're both also limited by the fact that they're both they're both white papers. You know, they, they sort of like take for granted that, okay, this is the frame we're going to use. It's we're already in the world of like data and, and objective analysis and a kind of scientific approach, which I think is um, yeah, that's just like, that's one angle on how to do this. And a keynote speech is another angle. You see what I'm saying? Um, here's another example. I play Hanabi with my wife and we love it. And in it's a collect it's a um, collaborative game, and you're trying to get to uh, your 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 score is how many cards you successfully play uh, before the end of the game. But there was a certain point, so you, there's the 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 perfect score is 25. And while we were playing, it's the kind of game that you play, and then afterwards you analyze your play and you try to get better together because it's 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 cooperative. And at a certain point, we had to realize that's like oh well the. The, the game is clear that every card you play is worth a point and the maximum points you can get is 25. But there's an ambiguity there because should we be playing in such a way to maximize our expected score 
Or should we play in such a way to maximize the chance that we get a perfect score? Those two things are different. And they're, they're different strategies that, that are implied by those two things. So here, even in a clearly defined, tiny little formal system, you have this kind of open-ended ambiguity of like, oh, well, which of these do we do we want? You know, well, what do we want from this game? Like, why are we enjoying it? And which of these ways of thinking about it gives us more of that? Um, here's one that I, I hope everyone here is familiar with this amazing work on adversarial policies in superhuman Go AI. If you're not, I really encourage you to seek it out. There's a ton of great work. This is um, uh, done by Tony Wang at al. Um, and the what they are showing here in this work is that the same engine, basically Kata Go, which is a modern uh, Go engine, is basically the same core engine as AlphaGo. And what they're showing is that there is a very simple technique that even an, a good amateur Go player can, can use to beat these superhuman Go AIs like 95% of the time. It's mind blowing. It is it is so interesting. It has to do with a blind spot that they uh, that these uh, that this engine has in its um, interpretation of what is and isn't safe. And if you can like, create this this one kind of ring structure, which again I could do, like I can beat AlphaGo basically using this this thing. It's it's so interesting. It's um, it's an example of this kind of adversarial quality, right? These adversarial policies are the same kinds of things you get with like prompt injection attacks and the same things you can get where like, if you have a system, if you have a formal system, it is going to be uh, vulnerable to these kinds of things because I can study your, if it's a closed formal system, if, if you know, like how to go, I can study it. I can find one of these blind spots, find one of these weaknesses and attack using that. And Katago itself has no idea what's going on because Katago isn't aware of itself as a thing in the world that has a win rate and doesn't see that it's losing over and over again to an amateur's trick. It's just like all it can do is what it does. Like, so you can imagine, oh yeah, it's easy to imagine how we might fix that. We just have a module that like looks at our overall win rate, has some side of kind of awareness of, 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 you know, the, 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 the software is a thing in the world that has a win rate. And, and it's like, when it sees that it's losing in a weird situation like this, it's easy, right? We can solve that with that kind of module, but it's, it's just, you can imagine that that doesn't end there, right? This is a kind of an endless process of evolution. And I think that there's something um, deep about the future of, of superhuman AI in all categories that this speaks to. So I found this truly. And finally, and then I, I know I'm, I'm a little bit over, I'll wrap up. Um, to me, Magnus Carlsen, the greatest uh, living chess player, possibly the greatest chess player of all time, the fact that he's, doesn't even want to be the world champion anymore. He's like, I can't deal with this. I don't like it. I'm not enjoying it. Um, what am I doing here? Like what? To me, there's something so beautiful and so meaningful uh, about the fact that Magnus Carlsen is bored of, of classical chess. Um, and what does that mean? Like that's the difference between Magnus Carlsen and, and Kadago. Um, the, 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 this is what say, this is what, this is what prevents Magnus Carlsen from being exploitable uh, by, by certain kinds of adversarial attacks in the same way. This idea of boredom, uh, I think, is 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 um, super important and interesting and under uh, and under recognized and under studied. Um, and I think that that Magnus Carlsen getting bored of chess is a little bit like Marcel Duchamp getting bored of art. And, and I think both of those questions are not answers exactly, but are questions that are themselves prompted by this larger question of the, of the power and limits of formal systems in general to tell us about the world. Uh, so that's where I'll leave it. I don't have any answers exactly. I just have a bunch of questions. These questions I think are important. I think they're lurking around everything we do. And I want to uh, throw light on them and call attention to them and just kind of like get us all to kind of like appreciate the weirdness of, of that. Um, this is the book. 
that I just wrote. And a lot of these ideas are kind of like, I'm trying to pull, there's a thread that this is one of the important threads of that, that uh, my, my book is about. Uh, so I'm kind of like uh, pulling it out of there and, uh, and that's it. That's my talk. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, yeah, I'll start with a question. In uh, The Beauty of Games, you have a very nice description of games um, in which every game is an interactive system, a set of interlocking behaviours bound by rules through which we navigate as players with our choices and actions. So I think this captures games really nicely and covers every game I can think of. Uh, but most definitions of games have something the lines of games having a well-defined outcome. Is that something you've deliberately omitted? Um, yeah, but well, I think, first of all, I think the, um, the project of trying to come up with a really robust definition of games is, um, is a bit of a, a, a red herring. I just think like you, it's just, it's fame, like Wittgenstein famously used games as the example for how hard definitions are in general. It's like, look, language is this slippery thing. It never really reduces down to anything super precise. Like, look at the example of games. We use the same thing, the same word to describe tennis that we use to describe bridge. How could two things be more different, you know? And mm -hmm. I think he's true. I think he's he was correct about that. Um, uh, you know, Alan Turing was a student of Wittgenstein. And I didn't know this until recently, right. uh, which I just find amazing. And um, Wittgenstein used to... Um, cancel class if uh, Alan Turing couldn't show up. If Alan Turing wasn't going to show up, he's like, okay, we're not going to have class today. What's the point? <laughs> like he really understood, like because I really understood like what, what was happening and, and the importance of, of uh, this young, you know, Alan Turing uh, figure. Um, but I, I, yeah, I don't, so I don't think that, yeah, there's no precise definition of games. We don't need one because we, um, it works well enough. Like, like if I, you know, if, if, if I, I like to think of it in terms of just um, examples of, of where this might happen. Like if there's, um, if, if, if in a room I have a copy of Microsoft Word and a copy of uh, Kid Picks, you guys remember Kid Picks um, or, or like Photoshop, maybe not Photoshop wouldn't be a good example, but like the sim, maybe Sims, the Sims or something. Anyway, I tell you, um, oh, go into that room and get me the game, right? You'll understand that you're, I'm talking about Sims. I'm not talking about Microsoft Word. I'm talking about the Sims, right? And you'll bring me the correct thing. But the Sims doesn't really have an outcome, like a specific, most people play the Sims. They don't have a specific outcome that they're trying to achieve. But that doesn't prevent us from understanding that, you know, the Sims is a game in that context. Even if, you know, if you bring a little, you know, spotlight to it and put it up on the, um, alien autopsy table and try to open it up and see, does it have all of the necessary qualities? Nah, it, it doesn't matter. Once you put something on an autopsy table, you've already lost the, the, the you know, the, the, the important train of thought that you were on. Yeah. Uh, Ingo asks, could a neural net for chess become bored by chess? And if so, how would we measure this? Yeah, this is exactly the question at the heart of what I'm interested in. <laughs> like, I think, um, what would it mean to be bored? Like, like it's funny, the exercise that, um, that mentally that I go through when I think about this kata go, like I think about the the relationship between kata go as a piece of software, this superhuman go AI, which is basically the same thing as, as AlphaGo, right? And the team that has to maintain kata how to go like those are the guys that are staying up late at night and like trying to fix this this flaw that's been discovered um and they they're like oh god what do we have to do to fix this should we should we even bother fixing it like who cares like maybe we should make a new version you know or maybe like who, like this is a thing that maybe it's just fine to have this no one's using it like like no one's really exploiting it to it's not causing problems in tournament go or it's not causing problems in game analysis or anything like that or but no it feels weird it kind of bothers me and it, it's a kind of blemish on my career a little bit for this flaw to be left unsolved 
involved. And it's like, these are the kinds of things that, that the Katago team that motivates their behavior versus whatever it is Katago is doing, which isn't really motivated behavior at all. It's just this like machine that is like you turn a crank and it produces the, the next move. Um, like, and this is the gap, like how to go becoming, like having some of the qualities that, that that the team has, which is that it cares about its reputation, that it's aware, that it's embarrassed by losing to this trick over and over again. You know what I mean? Like embarrassment, like like that, like what, like, and all of the questions that we are now or that we're going to face over the next ten years while we wait for chess to be solved, uh, all of these questions of like synthetic minds and you know presumably unless unless we're gonna stumble into another winter which whoever you know i don't know it doesn't seem likely right it seems like we're gonna have a bunch of of we're gonna have some degree of continued improvement i think these are the important questions like it's not can we get better and better and better at go at solving go like problems um it's like what are the relationships between um embarrassment and boredom and playing go well like it's weird to imagine that these things that we think of as messy sloppy unimportant like these emotional things pride and boredom and anxiety and embarrassment um like if you solve the kata go adversarial policy thing it's going to take you towards that it's taking you in that direction it's not just about making more and more of the world go like that's not going to work you can't like you know solving that's what the beauty of these ga of games is <laughs> in, in my in my opinion is that you take a little corner of the world and you try to isolate it and turn it into a, a, a formal system and then you you try to understand um what that reveals and it what it what it reveals is like it's endlessly complicated and interesting and cool even if you try to simplify it and abstract it and turn it into something like super super simple um it continues to kind of like open up into these new uh things so yeah so i i um yeah i, I actually think this question of of making ai that can be bored uh is a really important one mm -hmm. And Peter asks, what does it take to make a game entirely uninteresting? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think about this all the time. On the one hand, like part of me wants to say, look, everything's interesting. Like we, we've played Go for thousands of years because it's beautiful. It's a beautiful rule set. But... Go is a beautiful rule set because we played it for thousands of years is also true. You know what I mean? Like there's there's the quality of the rule set of Go. Oh, it's so good. It's so elegant. It's perfect. It's like, um, do you know what I mean? It's like Conway's life or uh, or Wolfram's rule seven or whatever his one rule is. Like, look, there's a bunch of these rules in Automata and then a few of them produce this particular thing. That's true. But it's also kind of true that um, Go, some of the quality of Go is the, the, the perfect, you know, rule set. But some of the quality of Go is the place we agreed to meet and dig. It's like part of that, like, and that's true of Shakespeare as well. It's true of aesthetics as well. Um, that's one of their openness. Uh, that's one of the qualities of being open and messy um, is that uh part of their meaning is the the fact that we that they are um that they are a an organization problem right they're not just a a um a formal well defined formal problem they're also a coordination problem um and so we have to like th they're a place that we're going to agree to kind of come together and play and dig and find meaning collectively and in that sense they're a protocol uh more than being um a, a specialty uh uh you know unique set of, of properties okay uh jaco asks how formal does a game have to be and is rhetorics a game you know i, I think rhetoric rhetoric uh debate i think debate is a game 
Mm-hmm. I think the broader category of rhetoric, like what we're doing right now, I don't feel like that's a game. I think it's important to recognize the artificiality is is a um, the artificiality of games is a feature, not a bug. Right. It's not like we, oh, if only we could close the gap and make a game that's just, you know, like the the holodeck. You know, this is the kind of simulation fallacy that that games are trying to be these perfect uh replications of life, or that that there is no difference between between games. No, it's the difference between games and life that gives them their leverage. We like this gap. We like this difference. This is it wouldn't be useful otherwise. It's like an edible fork is not is not useful as a fork that can't be that doesn't dissolve in saliva. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay, do we have any more questions? No, I think that's it. Okay, so thank you very much for the talk. Very thank interesting. You.